Hello, everybody, and welcome, 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 welcome uh, to the celebration of a new American musical on film. We want to say congratulations on this amazing premiere. I'm so pleased to be able to be here with you tonight in the Zoom room to celebrate this work. But before we go any further, some of you are probably looking at me going, who is this man? So let me tell you who I am. I am Damone Serafin. I'm a musical theater performer and director, and I'm also the founding artistic director of the New American Theater Company, New York. And I've had the pleasure of getting to know the writers of this incredible film uh, through my previous work uh, with Prospect on their show, Bridges, Prospect Theater Company. I'm a de facto member of that one too. Uh, <laughs> and so I'm excited. I'm excited to dig into the, into the work. I want to introduce you to Christina Franklin. Hey, Christina. How are you, my love? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm so, so good. Ladies and gentlemen, Christina, she is the director for this incredible film. And I got to tell you, Christina, I had a chance to see a rough cut. Uh, it looks good. You Thank did a good job. Thank Big congrats you. to you. Big congrats. And in a fast time, right? Yeah. A very, very quick weekend turnaround. But I have to say that I was fully set up for a success with such an incredible team and support from Prospect, and then walking in, receiving an incredible script, and then walking in to meeting these phenomenal actors. I All I had to do was just like show up in a lot of ways, but. Awesome. It's funny that you mentioned this incredible script. Can you tell me uh, just kind of what was your uh, response to this material? And had you had any connection uh, to the original musical or the musical before this, uh, Bridges? So yeah, help us with that. Totally. Um, yeah, so I got uh, I got the script and, and information about this project early October. And quite honestly, I was just in the thick of 2020. Um, I, I teach in high school, so we are also like getting our bearings. So my brain was very clouded with all the happenings. Um, so it was very refreshing to read Don't Stay Safe because it was talking about all the happenings without talking about all the happenings. Sure. And it was talking about the humanity of it all. I found myself in all my happenings, you know, just like doing, trying to keep up with this new way that we're all living. And none of us were taking a moment of being like, okay, but how are you? How, is, how are you adapting? Yeah. So I found that this script and the story possessed so much humanity in a way of um, addressing what was going on, but getting to the heart of the matter. Um, and I was, it, would, it blew my mind when I found out that, that this was um, uh, connected to a, fuller piece and earlier piece um because there's something i think i've said this in various uh, emails or meetings that there's something heartbreaking but also beautiful about the um the fact that history rhymes i don't think history repeats but it rhymes mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. there is something very what does that mean christina that's that's really cool i like the thought what does that mean yeah. i think it's um we do as like humans we do a good sense of learning from our past, but clearly not enough, you know, clearly not enough to be like, great. So that this is literally what happened before. Let's do the opposite. Um, so I think we are, we're good at acknowledging, but not fully changing. So I don't think it repeats, but I do think it rhymes. Oh, I love that. I love that. I'm okay. stealing it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I totally stole it from someone else, but I was like, yep, that's, I didn't come up with that, but yeah. Um, you mentioned something interesting. We're all kind of in this pandemic, we're thrust into this, position of working in new ways, right? And I understand that you are a theater director and educator. Had you ever had experience in directing film or in this kind of virtual aesthetic? Yeah, um, so I had very limited film experience. Like I know I took a class in college and um, but that was very much the technical side of things, not necessarily directing for film. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot that I learned in the moment, but that was that was great because that's also how I learned theater. And there was a lot of that knowledge that I had that I just had to like kind of switch around. Um, yeah. But um, uh, mm -hmm. but, yeah, I, I I hadn't. I'm still learning about the Zoom directing and and. <laughs> um, again, the thing, one of the things that I struggle with sometimes in theater is the subtle moments of humanity, the subtle, the moments of silence, the moments of human connection that aren't um, obvious. So that was something very fun to play with in the film world. And the mm -hmm. fact that this was very much a hybrid of a musical film and it wasn't one or the other, specifically both. 
Um, so that was exciting, but it was very much a learning um, in the moment kind of thing. But that's, that's what I prefer rather than a six hour college class in film. Well, tell me about that for sure. Listen, everybody's learning, right? We're all learning how to work in this medium. So, and, and you, you were thrust together with a team, uh, namely a cinematographer, right? And so how do you work with your cinematographer in this kind of new medium? Because it's not theater and it's not necessarily film. We're, 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 we're in new waters here. So how does that partnership work together? Yeah, I um, I think the way I approach everything I work on, um, even things on stage when I'm working with designers is following the emotion of it. And I feel like, um, you know how in sing-alongs they have a little bouncy ball that goes with the words? Mm -hmm. I feel like in every story, there's a bouncy ball that goes along with the emotion. So mm -hmm. you're just following that. So in mm -hmm. theater, that might we might manipulate the audience's eye by playing with light so we follow the emotion of the story in whatever way um but in film you can just literally follow the people and that's that was great and that was so i i speak in emotion with um our cinematographer and i think with a lot of the people that uh i work with especially actors i'm an actor myself i mm, that's not true i used to be an actor <laughs> um so i know that like sometimes it's between actor and director there can be, you know, drop off moments of not quite understanding each other. Mm -hmm. However, when you come back to the emotion, again, the humanity of it, I find that I'm easily able to communicate with people regardless of their background, regardless of their training. They know what it's like to feel an emotion that we might be going for. So again, mm -hmm. we just follow that bouncing ball. That's incredible. I love that too. I'm taking a lot from you tonight, Miss Christina. Okay. Follow the <laughs> bouncing ball. Talking about following that emotional bouncing ball. You cannot do that unless a writer and a composer sets that thing in motion for you. And we have an incredible duo uh, in Cheryl Davis, who was the book writer and the lyricist for Don't Stay Safe, and Douglas Cohen, uh, who provided the music. He's the composer. And so I want to jump over uh, to hang out with Cheryl and Doug for a moment. Thank you so much. Uh, those of you in our virtual audience, show some love to Christina, the thumbs or whatever we can toss up there, do it, uh, because she did an incredible, incredible job. Thank you. Thank you. So much for this Thank insight. you so much. It's a pleasure yes. to be here and here Please. from everyone who I miss a lot. Thanks. Yeah. Well, it's a pleasure to celebrate you. And so now we're going to celebrate and love on Cheryl Davis and Douglas Cohen. Yay, Cheryl and Doug, we're so glad uh, to have you here uh, with us tonight. I'm stoked because uh, I have a particular uh, connection to you, having worked with you on Bridges. And so what a wonderful gift it was to be able uh, to see Frankie all grown up. Mm -hmm. uh, and don't stay safe. I was so excited uh, to see this. So I want to kind of hang out with you for a moment, Cheryl, and, and asking you, um, what, what was the genesis of this particular project? What was the genesis? And then can you give us a little bit of insight into your writing process for the book and the lyric? Well, the genesis was really Kara because uh, she and Prospect approached us and mm -hmm. said that That's they- That's Cara Reichel. She's the founding artistic director of Prospect Theater Company. Yay, Cara. Uh, she approached us and with this project that they're the vision project that they're working on of filming short musicals. And she said that she wondered, she'd been thinking about this. I said, wondered how would Frankie be responding in 2020 to today's current events, because when we leave the end of Bridges, Frankie has become politically aware, mm -hmm. and she's still very young. So it's a question of how does this character react 12 years after we've last seen her? She's a grown woman now. She's moved on with her life. Mm -hmm. So uh, that is the fascinating point here. And I said, you know what? That excites me. That really intrigues me to figure out how would Frankie respond? So that, I, I talked to Doug, and he said, you know what, we, we would love to get into this. We'd love to explore that. That's amazing. That's yeah. awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, I'm, you know, I've had um, a great experience with Bridges, uh, and it's important to, to know that Bridges, you, you don't have to have necessarily have seen Bridges in order to engage uh, Don't Stay Safe. It stands on its own. Thank you. Um, but 
I, I want to ask you beyond the linked characters between the two, uh, what do you see as the the big picture themes that kind of bring these two works together? Well, it's really the underlying message. I, I don't want to steal Christina's history rhymes, but the one the over, overwhelming message of Bridges is that the fight for civil rights continues in various forms through time. And in 2020, we just see yet another manifestation of that, because in Bridges, we have the Selma March in 1965. We have uh, the anti-Prop 8 movements in 2008. And now we have the overwhelming rise of Black Lives Matter. And I'd said to Doug, uh, back when we were still working on Bridges up in Seattle, we had a reading of it. It's like, if it were not completely historically uh, anachronistic, at the end of Bridges, I would love to have Frankie holding a Black Lives Matter sign. But that's just not what you did in 2008. But now we can metaphorically have her doing that. Mm -hmm. So I found that really wonderfully exciting about doing this project. It feels like it's really fulfilling the original vision of Frankie and her political awakening. Mm -hmm. uh, so when we were uh, looking at the story, I was found myself thinking, well, where is Frankie at? She's 28 now, so she's grown. She's got a job. I'm thinking that she's probably got a girlfriend. We're trying to think of where is she, where is she now? Uh, so that's where we started thinking, well, where is she now? How is she reacting to this? And she still is temperamentally, a, a, Conservative is a bad way of putting it, but cautious because it sure. takes her a whole show to come out to her dad. Yes. <laughs> so um, she's a temperamentally cautious person. She's going to still keep that, although she's been politically awakened. She knows that she's gay, so she's still going to be gay in this in, in twelve years later. Mm -hmm. uh, but so then thinking of well, but also I remember reading about all this stuff about the stress that the pandemic put on personal relationships. Mm -hmm. And I've been living with my parents since the since the world shut down, uh, so I don't have that partner stress, but I definitely have parental stress. <laughs> You're in this world with these people whom you love, but they're still driving you crazy. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, don't I know it? <laughs> don't I know it? Um, I, you know what I found interesting, uh, and and I don't know if I'm making too much of this in light of this kind of um, social and political unrest that we address in Bridget and then having um, Frankie kind of move through time, she came out as a young person mm -hmm. in a relationship with a white woman, a white girl. Mm -hmm. And then later on, she engages a relationship with this black woman, mm -hmm. still highly politicized, uh, still uh, in the midst of the kind of cultural and social unrest. Was that intentional? Uh, that she chooses this black woman to engage uh, relationally, or was that just the, uh, you know, Frankie grew up in, you know, her choices grew up too. Can I you think, speak to that? I think in my mind, more like Frankie grew up, and these are just this is just the woman that she has ended up with, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. we love Latoya, so. Yeah. Thank, you. <laughs> that was real. That's a, thank you so much, Cheryl, for, for giving us this insight. I want to switch over or pivot to Doug, uh, who's been sitting patiently. I know he's ready to jump what in. Said, I, I love what you said, so I'm only too happy <laughs> to have her express. <laughs> so, Doug, tell us a bit about this music, man. How did you, how, where does this music come from? That's number one. I'm going to ask you a series of questions. Where does this music come from? Because your mind is like, I can't even, your mind and your fingers, I don't know. <laughs> and then I want you to address how you and Cheryl uh, usually collaborate. So you got two questions, and then I'm going to follow up with some other ones. So first of all, where does this music come from? Well, it comes from being inspired by the material, you know, and sometimes we don't have an actual script yet. We have ideas. Mm -hmm. And to be very honest, and, you know, I was... I found this a daunting uh, assignment because with Bridges, we had the benefit of distance and time. Mm -hmm. We were looking back, uh, not only to Selma in, in 65, but also to um, the protests in Oakland, uh, op opposition to Prop 8. So we were doing this in 2015, and we had that benefit of time and space, which is, which is something that you know, as a writer, it gives you a little bit, that distance is a cushion a lot mm -hmm. of the times. But we were actually experiencing this in the here and now while we were writing this. And I just wanted to make sure that we could be authentic 
to this world, you know? And as a composer, um, that's a very tricky assignment because, you know, I'm, I'm being asked to write in a more contemporary voice. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, <laughs> Clara may not realize this, but I kind of put off signing the contract for a little while. <laughs> <laughs> now all the truth comes out, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> now it all comes out. You didn't spill the tea. Keep going, Doug. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, Cheryl and I would have these conversations and say, like, you know, can we do this? Is this something that is that we can accomplish? First of all, in a very short amount of time. So um, having these conversations with Cheryl about where the characters end up and, and what we're exploring in these 15 or so minutes did help a lot. And what I did and what I typically do um, sometimes Cheryl will just give me a lyric and that will definitely inspire me. But what I did in this case was I just would go to the keyboard and have these sessions and just kind of make believe. And I also went to the guitar, which is something I haven't done since uh, I think <laughs> the last song I wrote for the guitar was in the fifth grade uh, to enlarge my part in a musical. Um, <laughs> <laughs> as a narrator. So uh, that's the last time I turned to guitar, but I turned to it now because I knew that one of the characters, Eddie, was going to play the guitar, and it felt like it's a sound that we should explore for this piece. But I did have a couple really productive sessions, and what I typically do is I, I record them on my iPhone, and then I send them right over to Dropbox, my personal private Dropbox. <laughs> and when I felt ready to share these files, I invited Cheryl to the Dropbox. And I already had put comments like, disregard the first one minute and 30 seconds. It only gets interesting here. And you know, what do you think? And, and she would then put her comments in and we would look at them and I'd go, isn't that a good bridge? Don't you like that bridge? <laughs> Can we use that bridge? So that's how kind of we started to explore the sound of Don't Stay Safe. Mm -hmm. And then when we felt like, wow, this is, this is something we can achieve, that's when, we committed and uh and it was actually pretty i thought it was a really smooth process from there on yeah well the result is absolutely remarkable uh, but we we are forced to create in this pandemic and this pandemic is forcing us to create in these kind of new ways right our processes have to shift yeah uh and so did, did you find uh, a great shift in your process uh, working remotely, not being together in the same space? Um, it, it, was it an impediment? Did it push you? Tell, tell me about that. Yeah, it was different. It was definitely different because we're, we're so used to being in the same room and sharing, uh, you know, and going through songs together. Sometimes we would create songs in the same room. There are times when, you know, I, I would be with Cheryl and I'd play her something and it wasn't quite right and she would talk about something else and then something else would would, would percolate and then certain, we'd have a song, a whole new song, you know? Um, but we didn't have the benefit of it this time. And there were also just moments when we knew we had deadlines. And it was really difficult because we had to write out, I had to write out music and I didn't have the lyric yet. And it was just all that that you can usually accomplish in the same room. But when you're dealing with, we didn't have Zoom, we could have done Zoom, but we did, we're, we preferred to just kind of wait for those emails mm -hmm. and then download the lyrics and then I would send things back. And there were times when it was like handing a term paper late, you know, and I regretted that because uh, I always like to be totally, you know, punctual, but there were a few hours that we budged, I would say, but we were pretty good about it. And I, I just know that it's a very different working relationship and um, you have to kind of, I think, my feeling is you've got to kind of anticipate. Just kind of set, set things down and know they're going to change. And when you get the new information, you make that, those changes, but you don't wait until it comes to you. You have yeah. to kind of take a more proactive stance. And I think Cheryl did that too. Uh, but I'll let her answer for that. Good. Cheryl, did you want to add into that? No, I think Doug put it very well that it's... Uh, we have, I think we really enjoy working together and in, in the same room, actually for Bridges, we sat down and we wrote like a couple of songs, like he was at the piano and I'm spitballing lyrics. So we are very familiar with doing that. And it was a little slower listening to like all the soft stuff on Dropbox. 
Mm -hmm. So I would listen to it and I'd write notes and then listen to that one and would write notes. And then some, wait, I now have to go back and listen to the first one again because I don't compare it to that all. But it was just fascinating to hearing where Doug went. Mm -hmm. All of these different directions in the music as you, a fraction of what he wrote ended up in the actual show. Sure. So there was a lot of stuff that I was just like, oh, that's really cool. Oh, that's really cool. Can we do this and this together? Mm -hmm. And some of that ended up in the show that way. I think the, the duet is that kind of like how that came up with two separate musical threads. Christi, that's great, Cheryl. Christina, I want to ask you because Doug said something really interesting just about this process and the, and the kind of the, the speed bumps that you engage in this kind of process when you're creating a new musical, when you're in the room, you know, it's a bit easier uh, to deal with those speed bumps. But what was that process for you in this kind of virtual space? Because I think you guys went kind of back and forth, right? You were on set a bit and then you have to communicate. Tell me what that process was like. Yeah, um, most of the, most if not all of our pre-production preparation stuff was virtual. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of the, the main difference that I, as a director, had, um, where I might like be in a room with Kara and our writers and, and talk things out. Um, those moments happen virtually. Um, and then we had the one day of rehearsal to, to knock it all out. So that's kind of where I adjusted of like, okay, here it comes, all of it. Just yeah. do it. Um, so there was, there was there that that was an adjustment, but it was really cool because I'm a I'm a um, I'm a planner and I like a there's there's a way to stage and go about theater where you can be aware of the arc the whole time, but in film is a little different. It's you're 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 flying by the seat of your pants in a way, but then on the other side, I think that leaves a lot of cool um, fertile ground for in the moment discoveries. And like the actors being in character for hours and hours and hours, um, that just, that brings out creativity. So like by the second half of our second day, our first day of filming, all three of the actors were like, I hear what you're saying, but like, what if I did this? Like, this feels a little more natural. And by Sunday, it was, it was even more. And I love that kind of stuff. And in theater, sometimes there's not that room or space um, because maybe there is a plan or maybe the, the circumstances don't leave room for that but um yeah that was my that was mostly my my shift um I had I, we had to shift to finding things in the moment rather than doing like a week of table work and figuring things out and then going mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. so I think that was beneficial in ways and definitely for me as a as I just learned different ways of directing hey, I want to get John Brunston up in the up in the conversation John man First of all, what a Herculean task, right, uh, that you had. Uh, and you were right there on stage playing every note that we heard. So can you talk to us a bit about uh, your process for teaching this music and, and pulling it all together in like five minutes? <laughs> I mean, I mean look, like, Douglas's music is not simple. Like, I'm like that's, that is not the word that you would use to describe Douglas's music at all. No! <laughs> um, and so, but what was great was we had such lovely musicians as actors working on the piece that like, cause uh, we were having discussions from the very beginning, like, oh, well, if we have to make adjustments for these, you know, this is the first we're hearing these songs on these voices, mm -hmm. um, really is that weekend. Um, you know, we had a little pre-production Zoom, but um, the first time that we really got to really experience that music was then. And so we were like, oh, we have all these backup plans. We have these uh, options. But regardless, um, everyone came in so prepared and they were such good musicians that we were all able to immediately go to interpreting instead of correcting and fixing. And I mean, like a lot of times with musicals, it's you're spending a lot of time teaching or you're spending time correcting. Um, mm -hmm. And that wasn't, neither one of those things ended up having to be the case. We were able to just go right to interpreting the material and um, really living in the material and seeing what those things were and um, letting the... Um, what was happening physically adjust what was happening to the music um you know really quickly we were able to dive to a really far place really really quickly and that was astonishing to me um how quickly we were able to dive in that deep end we had brought a lot of different incredible keys. team yet such what's that doug we brought a lot of different transpositions with us just in case good <laughs> we didn't know how it would sound in people's voices so there was a couple songs we had maybe like three or four keys that we just yeah, sure. 
Sure, sure. You had such an incredible uh, toolbox, though, to play with, though. So that that makes the process easier. Yeah. Yeah. Um, with in your team. And it was also really useful because Douglas was so willing to say, let's, let's, we're going to make things work. Like some people are very um, stiff about things. Yeah. And like Douglas was like very, this is the music and we can, we, we you know, the, the music is alive and this is a live moment. And so what is it that we need to do? And the adjustments, there were very, there was almost nothing of that. But the fact that we had that ability yeah, there was a huge difference. Yeah, to have a, an open and fluid collaborator like that. That's Doug and Cheryl both together. So that's a gift uh, for you, uh, certainly, and Christina uh, as, as director, musical director. You know, we're performing and working in this pandemic, right? And musicals are especially hard uh, to do in this way. So tell me, uh, what was it like coming back to work in a room uh, with singers with all of the kind of safety protocols? I mean, it was just really beautiful, first of all, to get to collaborate with somebody in real time again. Because um, I have already had been doing, during the pandemic, several purely digital things. And the fact that we were able to be in a room creating together is really the soul of theater to me. And so, like, you know, like, even though this is a filmed project, uh, it really felt like we were really being in a theatrical place. And I was surprised how much so that felt that way without an audience being there. Um, that, you know, I always assumed that that was the most, you know, that's a really crucial component for a theater piece, but that the relationships between the people in the room are so important and were so missing for me during other projects I've been working on during the mm -hmm. pandemic. Like mm -hmm. this was incredibly moving to get to do that again. Wow. Well, congratulations to the entire team, uh, and we celebrate you for the work that you've done. But the work doesn't just stop with you all, because there's an incredible cast who brings the words and the music to life. And so I want to I wanna bring this cast on uh, and, and get some insight from uh, Iris, uh, Latoya, and Nigel. Man, you guys did that thing, for real. For real, for real, you did it. It was, it was beautiful, and you did it in this kind of, you know, compact uh, situation. And so, again, having uh, had the privilege of watching this rough cut, my mind was blown. And that is not even finished. They're still working on it, uh, and it looks so incredible. So, can each of you just kind of give us a bit of your your own background as performers and and how you approached uh, diving into the characters of this project? Nigel, why don't we start with you? Okay, ma'am. Hey, uh, uh, well, um, I'm Nigel Robinson. Uh, I'm an actor, musician, and writer. Uh, I've been in the city for about five years, and um, I've, I've been working mainly as a, I usually have an instrument attached to me whenever I do something. I've become the instrument boy, and my agent knows that too. So I'm always always have something in my hand, which is, is fantastic, and. Um, I love that this project came along because first thing I'm like, oh, I get to work with people in real life mm -hmm. and film it with Prospect Theater Company. And I have wanted to work with Prospect for a very long time. And I think I told Cara that already, but I've wanted to work with him for a long time. So um, I was just really excited. And um, I don't know, like uh, when we started getting emails about it, it was, it was you, we were told that like, we need to come in prepared. And so I just sat in my room by myself a lot walking around, looking in the mirror, singing these songs with a guitar, just trying to get a feel of like, get the words in my mouth and like, like try and make some choices and thank God for my wonderful girlfriend because she helped me make the audition tape <laughs> for this. And I just decided like, I'm just gonna pretend like I'm FaceTiming somebody. And it was a very odd audition tape, but it, I, you know, I just wanted to make some, a, a, a different choice and, and it happened to work out. But um, I don't know, like I, I really gravitated towards the music and I gravitated uh, towards the script and it was, it felt like me a lot, a, a younger, a little younger version of, of myself. And um, I just, um, all those things resonated with me about um, wanting to get out there and wanting to be a part of the, the movement, wanting to have my voice heard and want to sing as loud as like my, my people in the past did. So I, I had a really fun time just being because it was so much of Nigel. And not, I mean, I just, you know, you walk out and you say, my name is Eddie and people believe that. But like, I was actually able to be a lot of Nigel yeah. under the guise of, of Eddie. But um, 
it was just really fun and and to have a guitar and to attach an instrument to a character and that be like i was i felt like i was on two sides of like the creative team like i was a performer but then i was also a musician as well because when i wasn't on stage i was playing some guitar too so john and i got to like sit together and work things out and the freedom that came with this project is fantastic because usually i, I know john just said something about this but you know sometimes composers and lyricists are very married to what they wrote and you cannot deviate and they will not you know I, some people just are like that and they're like nope so kind. Is this house. So kind. <laughs> but, but doug just so happened to be was like oh well you know you can take this note you can do that you can do whatever and just that you know it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to do it but like the freedom to know that oh, i can create and i can create something that feels comfortable and it feels like me but it's their music mm -hmm. so you know i got to kind of make up guitar parts which i've never done in my life so like it was just it was i it was such a beautiful experience and like there was never a there was never a feeling of like pressure on set like everyone was so relaxed and so calm and we were all there and professional and just there to get a beautiful thing accomplished and that's exactly what happened no one ever raised their voice it was it was fantastic i would want to do that over and over and over again like it can be my every weekend thing and it would be actually every day thing i don't want to just do it on the weekends but i had a fantastic time awesome awesome thank you for sharing that man and and it shows it shows uh in the work so congratulations to you thank you Elise. Hey. Denise, what's up, lady? Hey, how you doing? <laughs> I'm so excited to talk to you. What were some of the discoveries you made on this journey? Yeah, um, you know, when Cara called me and when she, when I heard that uh, Douglas and Cheryl would be on the team, my heart exploded, uh, truly. It really did. And I remember the last scene of the musical, um, Doug was in the room with us and Cheryl was on a computer and Doug was holding the computer so Cheryl would see and I, we didn't have an audience, but um, I felt like, <laughs> felt like I was making like mom and pop proud um, <laughs> up in the corner of like the audience. And um, uh, I, I think it just made everything, all my, all my relationships and the journey that I've had as an actor in high school and up until this moment in this very tumultuous time, um, uh, it, it was a deep sense of comfort and full coming around full circle. Uh, yeah, um, but another another thing that I experienced was um, the fact that everything that we were doing, um, w w everything that was happening was unfolding in front of us. I remember being in the living room during the first day of protests and um, I told myself, I, I'm living with my parents, they're 70 years old, they are in a vul they're in the vulnerable group, and I can't, I can't risk anything. Um, but I was like reading my book and outside my window, I hear chanting um, in the distance and I, I couldn't stop myself. I had to put on shoes, I had to get out there. And I told myself, if I, I, I'll go somewhere else, I had to. And in that, I realized that, um, me and Frankie did share so much, so much in common um, with having to balance what is responsibility and what, like, what, what we have to sacrifice to carry out what we, what is kind of our goal in life besides career and anyway. Um, I'm someone who is really obsessed with research when it comes to doing character work and hear the fact that everything was unfolding in front of me. I had to rely on my own experience and the experiences of my friends of New York Times articles that were being released day of. Um, it was all really, really fresh. Um, but to have such a strong group of people, um, people that I trusted, um, people who were so open, um, made me able to open my heart up and open my heart and um, make make choices in the room like christina said and have e and have ease in communication um yeah <laughs> <laughs> well it's it's obvious that the the journey had a significant impact and so we celebrate the work that, that you were able to do in this piece again all of you but certainly you absolutely incredible so thank you so much for sharing thank you last but not least miss latoya <laughs> Hey. What's up? What's up, you? <laughs> That's brilliant. 
<laughs> brilliant, just brilliant. That's, I don't even know what else to say. Just brilliant. Uh, my question to you is, um, were there any particular challenges on this journey uh, that you had to overcome? Like, what were the challenges to this process for you? Um, the beautiful thing about this is that there actually weren't many challenges, actually, in terms of the making of it, in terms of the embodying of it. I think the thing that was coming to mind or that is coming to mind for me is just that um, there definitely was a bracket of who was more vulnerable to this pandemic. And I think the character that I play, Taylor, showed that um, COVID doesn't care who you are. You know, COVID doesn't care whether or not you had pre existing conditions. COVID was affecting people my age, healthy people as well, you know? And so I think just shedding a light on how powerful the pandemic is, how life changing, how life altering the pandemic actually is, um, was just more solidifying of how seriously we should be taking it. And so I was just grateful that this kind of story regarding this character could be told because I think for a lot of people, um, they disregarded how serious it was because I'm of a certain age and I am of a certain amount of health um, that I don't need to be worried. But um, Cheryl did such a good job of like raising awareness to the fact that um, we all should be taking it a little bit more seriously than we probably were. Yeah, wow, that's incredible, that's incredible. Thank you so much, Latoya, the work. Man, man, absolutely breathtaking. So thank you for sharing. I'm excited for everyone to see this incredible work. I have to pivot back to our uh, artistic director. Yeah, that, that's Kara, wave again, Kara, there you go. There she is. Uh, and so for you, Kara, can you, can you, um, can you tell us what do you think is the future of this vision series for, for Prospect? What is your, your takeaway about how this filmmaking process of putting musicals uh, into a new medium? Yeah, it's, um, it's been a learning curve and I'm, you know, I think we went into Prospect as, a, as an organization, went into this with a lot of determination and passion to keep doing what we love doing. And um, we, we didn't have a lot of experience. And um, that's sort of how we began the company actually years ago. You know, we were just like kids out of college. We came to the city and decided to dive in and start doing shows. So there was a lot of um, remembering what that was like. And I just have to say to everyone here, I am so grateful for everyone saying yes and diving in, even though there was a lot about this process that was an experiment and was unknown. So I think that coming out of it, now that we have a little more expertise, I, I do feel that this is a valid new way of sharing work. And I'm excited to see what audiences we can reach beyond the normal confines of a small New York City theater. I, I feel like we've been able to broaden the people that can see new work um, by putting it up on YouTube um, free and accessible. And um, while I don't think we ever would have gotten to this place had it not been for the challenges of the pandemic, um, I'm really proud of um, what all of the artists who are involved with this series um, have created. And I, I think it's going to outlast 2020. I think that the messages of, of this film and all of the, the projects we've done um, are things that are gonna stand the test of time. And so I hope that all of us here, you know, we can look back on this year and, um, and what we made and you know, even though it's been tough, have have some bright spots and, and be proud of the work that was was created, so. Awesome. Kara, can you tell us as we wrap up this session, what are the ways that we can track the work in this series? How can we follow the work in this series? Uh, well, it's pretty easy. You can either go to the Prospect website, prospecttheater.org, um, and all of the, the films and the talkbacks are hosted there, or you can just go to the Prospect Theater Company YouTube channel and if you're watching this, you're probably already on our YouTube channel. So just keep watching, you know, click ahead and, and, and watch the films. And also we'd appreciate it if people shared, um, shared the work, um, passed along and also subscribed to the channel. So 
Yay. Well, thank you all so much. It has been a pleasure and honor to host tonight's Zoom gathering, and I want to encourage you to do just that. Go to those platforms, follow the work. I promise you will not be disappointed. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. I am Damone Seraphim. Mwah. Thank you all. Congratulations. Goodbye.